Okay, so you can hear in the background an outboard motor, which is fairly modern in comparison to the days of the people we're going to talk about. But what really has changed, if you sat on a boat similar to this, going down the River Cam, um, you wouldn't really have noticed anything that's changed in the last hundred or so years. I mean, the river looks the same. The river, the weeds, the, bu the buildings, the little boat shelters and so on, they all look the same as in Alan Turing's days. And it makes you wonder what really has changed in our lives and how we've come to this. So would somebody from a hundred years ago, say, recognize the world we live in today? Well, for most parts of it, yes. But we need to know what has changed technology-wise in the past, and then we'll cover what is going to happen in the future. So let's have a look. I mean, most of what you see wouldn't have really changed from the early 19th century. In fact, most of really what you see along here wouldn't have changed much since the 17th and 18th century in terms of what people do, what fun they have, what they use the rivers for and so on. And all along here on these paths, which are running by the bank, is where Alan Turing would run between Cambridge and Ely following the course of the river and he would do that on a regular basis. So what we're going to do is we're going to visit some of Alan Turing's legacies in this video because Charles Babbage was the grandfather or he's purported to be the grandfather of the computer industry and computers but Alan Turing is Genesis, ground zero. He's the one who made it all work and the one we actually base our modern computers on today. And uh, this is one of my ca little cameramen for the day, Brendan, say hi. Okay. He's gonna help with, out, out with some of the camera work today. So who was Alan Turing? Well, Alan Turing was an English mathematician and the pioneer of theoretical computer science and also artificial intelligence. And he helped crack the Enigma code in World War II. He was born in 1912 in Maidervale in London, England. And in 1922, the 10 year old was at a boarding school in Hazelhurst in Sussex where his teacher proclaimed he was a genius. Later at the age of 13, he went to Sherborne School in Dorset and his maths teacher Randolph declared him again a genius and it was unknown to them that he did a 60 mile cycle to the school because of a general strike. He was that keen to get to the school when he was only 13. And it was this time when he was at this school he formed a close relationship with Christopher Morcombe who sadly passed away in 1930 from tuberculosis. And it was also stated that Christopher was Alan Turing's first love. Well, later he attended King's College, the University of Cambridge, in 1931 to study mathematics. And he settled in much better there and he was highly successful at both his work and his social life. And he took up rowing and became an excellent long distance runner. He also became involved in the peace movement and joining the anti-war council which called for the ban on chemical warfare. But it was rowing that Cambridge was very well known for even at the time and it's you know interesting to note that he actually took up this famous pastime. But also here's a clip of what it would have been like in Alan Turing's time. Turing then went on to get a first class honours degree in 1934 at King's and was elected a fellow at King's College at the age of 22. In 1936 he went on to study mathematics at Princeton University in New Jersey, obtaining his PhD in 1938. And he, this is where he developed his notion of universal computing or a universal computing machine which could solve calculations. 
this would become known as the Turing machine and foreshadowed digital computing. At the same time at this university he also studied cryptology which were used to send secret messages and he built three out of four stages of an electromechanical binary multiplier. So what happened next? Um, Alan Turing was asked to join the Government Codes and Cipher School which is now GCHQ and it was basically a British code breaking organisation. This was moved to Bletchley Park when war was declared as they thought that it would have been a suitable secluded location where nobody would suspect code breaking was going on. And here his most notable achievement at Bletchley Park was cracking the Enigma code. He also developed a machine called the Bomb which was based on an earlier Polish design from the late 1940s and was decoding all messages by Enigma machines. Then he turned his uh, attention to German naval signals and it was used in the longest running battle the Battle of the Atlantic which went from 1939 to 1945 at the end of the war and it contributed to the Allied victory in the Atlantic. Shortly after he started working on a secure speech system which he named Delilah. The system was encoding and decoding voice communications and was intended to use or be used in a similar way to a telephone scrambler. He demonstrated the machine but it was never commissioned and never used. In 1945 Turing was summoned by the Queen and awarded an OBE for services to his country and in 1949 he was made a Deputy Director of the Computing Laboratory at Manchester University. Turing also addressed the issue of artificial intelligence in a famous paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, in 1950. In it he devised what he called the imitation game, now called the Turing test, a method to determine whether a machine was capable of showing behaviour that can be truly described as intelligent. This test itself has significantly influenced research into AI or artificial intelligence. So what was the Turing test? Well it was developed by Alan Turing in 1950 and it's a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behaviour equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human being. What he proposed was that natural language conversations between human and machine designed to generate a human-like response and it's kind of where I think Blade Runner got one of its original ideas. Now the evaluator would, would be aware that one or two partners in the conversation is a machine but all participants would be separated so they wouldn't know who was talking to who. And if the evaluator can't reliably tell machine from human it's said to have passed the test. And that's Turing's idea of what artificial intelligence should be. And the test results don't depend on giving the correct answers but how closely the answers resemble those that a human would give. And no one really has been able to kind of invent or use a machine that would get close to what Alan Turing was proposing. But it's, it's a kind of a, a baseline for artificial intelligence. You know, if you had an infinite number of questions or an infinite quant quantity of memory or an infinitely large machine would you be able to pull this off? That's basically the premise behind this theory. Okay so up to now we've gone through Alan Turing's life so to speak up to this point and it's around about 1952 where things really started to change for Alan. He was um, involved in a burglary. It was a burglar reported by himself and when it was investigated it was found that Arnold Murray who was involved with Alan Turing was um, basically the problem or the 
part of the burglary itself. And because of the um, laws of that time in the 1950s um, about you know gay relationships, homosexual relationships, um, Alan Turing was convicted and he was convicted of gross indecency and that gave kind of two choices one was um, going to prison and the other one was chemical castration um, either way um, it had the same result with Alan Turing losing his clearance for GCHQ and for his um, coverage that he had there and he was barred from continuing his work so he was basically ostracized from any governmental work going forward. Now that was kind of a really sad end as it was to Alan Turing's legacies and what he'd done throughout the war and what he'd done with the Enigma codes and so on and um, it seemed very very unfair but in 2013 the judgment was overturned and um, the conviction was effectively quashed but it was all posthumously all retrospectively because in 1954 Alan Turing was found dead he had apparently now committed suicide now the urban myth is that he took a bite of a poisoned apple and it was laced with cyanide and that's how he killed himself but it's kind of doesn't really fit because the the apple was found in his bedroom on his bedside table and it did have a bite out of it but it was nothing to do with his death and it was kind of a bit of an urban myth um the coroner at the time put it down to cyanide poisoning and um, it could have been down to an experiment that he was doing and he basically got you know something got away from him and he ended up poisoning himself now that's one theory the other theory was because of his clearance with the government it was kind of um, somebody wanting to get rid of somebody who knew too much and that was the other theory but it doesn't matter what the theory was it was an untimely death for someone who was effectively a genius and you know was really one of the major players in the allies winning the war what was his legacy well his, his legacy is basically ongoing even now because everything we do in the modern era is based around alan turing's laws alan turing's theory alan turing's test so to speak and artificial intelligence is an ongoing forward moving system that's actually we're never particularly going to see the end of it in most of our lifetime so moving forward he did more for the computer industry than almost any other person his legacy also with the code breaking is just unsurpassed it's something that helped the allies win the war Another accolade is Alan Turing was credited with designing the world's first chess program in 1950 and it was called Turbo Champ and you know it was the first attempt at a, a game really or a program to beat a human interactive subject and that was um, quite a step from electromechanical work to proper digital interaction with a computer. So I hope you enjoyed this look into Alan Turing's life and um, the achievements he did and the legacy of all of his work and the fact that we still use Alan Turing's test even today. So thank you for watching and I hope you will join us again on our next instalment of the guide to computer history. So thank you.